retired child psychiatrist um, and a lay Carmelite and uh, she's going to talk to us this evening all about the Zelie Martin. So, well, welcome to you. Thank you very much. Well my thanks to you Laura for uh, setting all this up in the first place and for inviting me to your second meeting. It's really lovely to be here and I've been looking forward to telling you about Zelie because to me it's so important that our, our sacrament of marriage is uh, fully acknowledged as a way of sanctity. You don't have to be a nun or a priest. They, God bless them, they're wonderful people. I'm not saying anything about that, but we have our role in the church. And I'm going to finish with a time for questions after. So I really value what your experiences and what it's like for you as parents, as well as uh, hearing about uh, Z.D. Martin. So I've got my clock here to try and not ramble on for too long and uh, just give me a hint and you probably crash me before we go. So thank you Laura, thank you Father John, that's your lovely church and all you lovely members of the Catholic Mothers of Oxford. So why is Zeely an, an inspiration for our Catholic families today, for modern families, not necessarily Catholic, all families, because they, their outreach is to every family that we, we know really. And uh, why were they beatified? Why were they made saints? What's so special about them? Well, the answer is actually, there's nothing special about them. They are ordinary people like you and me. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you today is to, to get there before that halo starts shining on their heads and uh, everybody feels, well, they're far too clever for us, well, they're far too holy, we can't possibly keep up with them, and put them in the back boiler. No, they want to be integrated. They want to be integrated into your family life, and Zelie in particular, because she's the one who wrote all the letters, which is why we know about her. Good thing she wasn't in this day and age, because it would have all been on Facebook, or <laughs> online, or in emails, and we might not have been preserved. So there is a book at the back, which um, is well thumbed book, which is a book of her letters, uh, and uh, you get a very vivid impression of what was going on for her during her married life, uh, from, that, from those wonderful letters. So Zeli and Mark, Louis, her lovely husband, were beatified on October the 19th in 2008 by uh, Pope Benedict XV. And somebody asked me, well, what was special about them? Why were they made saints? And I thought, well, I'm not quite sure, actually. I mean, I know why they're saints, but I wasn't sure of the reason for their beatification. And he wrote, and this is very important, um, Pope Benedict, um, they were beatified because uh, in fulfilling the wishes of our brothers, he said, that meant the bishops of the um, area in which they lived, who put their name forward to Rome. And, and he says, a multitude of the faithful. So saints are not made saints because Pope thinks somebody was rather holy. They're made saints because everybody who knew them thought they were holy <coughs> and thought they were saints even long before they died, like little Therese of Lisieux. Well, even she was thought by her fellow sisters, I should say, sister-sisters, um, to be just an ordinary person, but we know that she was more than that. Um, he also said, Pope Benedict said, that um, it, they were strengthened, Louis and Zeli were st strengthened by the sacrament of marriage and the example of the family of Nazareth. They were strengthened through the sacrament of marriage, and we'll come on to that. They didn't go into it feeling strong and wonderful. They went into it with all sorts of hang-ups and difficulties, just like you and I go into our marriages with all sorts of hang-ups and difficulties, and by golly, don't we find out. Um, they were also beatified because they testified their true love of God and the Virgin Mary and for the poor. 
and for the missions. And it's interesting that they're, um, they were actually sanctified on um, made saints on Mission Sunday, uh, October the 18th, 2015, by our Pope Francis. And finally, but I think most importantly, they were beatified because they consecrated themselves diligently to their children, quote unquote. They consecrated themselves diligently to their children. Their children were the ones that consecrated them in their marriage. And they consecrated their lives to their children. And we will see through Zini's example how her children, if you like, sanctified her. It's a two-way process. Um, and having just spent the day with my two grandchildren, the two-year-old uh, Pearl, she's called, she is a Pearl, um, her favourite word is mine, mine. <laughs> she's just discovered what mine is because she's got a big brother and it's very important to know what mine means. But uh, these children in their delightful freshness and delight in life um, surely bring God into our family life. If we know it or don't know it, he's still there in them. So they, were, um, they gave an extraordinary witness. This is the uh, technical phrase they use, something extraordinary witness of conjugal and family spirituality. And an example of the domestic church, we'll come on to that, domestic church from which the gospel radiates. I think domestic church has been very forgotten about. Domestic church is sitting here in this room in every single family that you are representing here this evening. Uh, and uh, it is a great uh, carriage of, of the church, of, the, of Christianity in, in the world. We come on to that. And um, I'm going to start, if you like, with a little sort of prayer from Zee. We're going to move on to her now. It's the very first letter in that book, um, Familial Correspondence, it's called, um, which she wrote to her little brother, Isidore. I'll come on to her her family. Very first letter she wrote, five years of marriage. When I think of what God has done for me and my husband, God in whom I've put all my trust, in whose hands I have put the care of my whole life, I don't doubt that his divine providence watches over his children with special care. And this was the way in which she lived her life. She wasn't a holy, pious person. She did go to Mass at 5.30 every morning. It's the only time she could fit Mass in. It was called the Workers' Mass. And it was just down the road, because I've been there. It's literally a three-minute walk, and it's probably a quick in and out. So, you know, and the neighbours laughed because they could tell the time by the hearing the front door close. But um, she wasn't what you might call a pious person. She did say her evening prayers and night prayers with the children. But she obviously had a very deep understanding and resilience born of that understanding that God was doing everything because he cared for her. And we'll move on to hearing about things which don't sound terribly much as if he cared for her, but she had this faith, which is what um, the uh, witness to, to, their, um, to their sanctity bore out. The sacrament of marriage is, is an interesting sacrament because it's ongoing. We don't go along and, I mean, I just went to a wedding up in Edinburgh last weekend, my, my husband's nephew, bagpipes, kilts, the lot, dancing till three in the morning, then all the ladies disappeared off and carried on for another few hours. Um, and they were all rugby players and the ladies beat the men, I have to say, in the uh, drinking competition. <laughs> they had to be the key lady being the bride, they had to be practicing. But uh, <laughs> that, and I, I explain that game to you later if you're interested. <laughs> but uh, it is not a one-off, is it? Um, so often the whole the day has become a, a huge uh, publicity stunt in a way. But the marriage, the sacramentality of the marriage, only begins there, and it carries right on. Through every single time you empty that dishwasher, you are acting out the sanctity of marriage. And that is just brilliant. It's just amazing. Um, however small, however difficult, or however boring, 
and it unites, the sacrament of marriage unites our relationship with our spouse, with our children, with the extended family, it unites that with our relationship with God. And we all in this room have a relationship with God, whether we think we have or not. It's part of our spirituality. We were born to know God, that catechism question. Why did God make you? God made me, God made me to know and to love and to serve and to be happy with him forever and the next. I remember that. And the first one was, why did, who made you? God made me. And this is the penny catechism. It shares my age, doesn't it? But to know him, to love him, to serve him, and to be happy with him. <laughs> forever in the next, but also forever, and the next life starts now, doesn't it, this minute? So however small, the sacrament of marriage is ongoing and transforming, if we allow it to transform us. And she will show us how it happened. In sickness and health, she'll show us that too. Giving each other mutual protection and support, she'll show us that. And it leads to this balance and growth. So what did she bring to her marriage? Now, if for all of us, I, it seems to me there's a time before marriage and there's a time after marriage. And that tying of the knot, or the tartan thing, we the two clamps that wound their tartans around each other's fingers and then pulled them apart and there they were knotted together. That's rather symbolic, rather lovely. Um, so we have the before and after marriage, and for some there is a third stage which is uh, after death of a spouse or separation or loss for other reason, which her husband Louis lived through um, after she died. But she died on the 28th of August, 1877. So we'll stay with Zeely, let's look at her journey. And it might ring bells for you on your journey. Before her marriage, she was born December the 23rd, 1831, jolly nearly a Christmas baby. And, um, <laughs> middle child, her big sister Elise was, was, became a nun, and she was you known as Sister Marie Do Dossifé, funny French name, Doss Dossifé, who became a teacher at the Visitation Monastery in Le Mans, which is about 30 miles from where they were living in Alençon. And her younger baby brother, Isidore, <coughs> who uh, was a medical student in Paris, and that first letter which I quoted to you was written to him in Paris, and her husband who's in the room while she's writing there to say, warn him about getting into trouble in Paris. He says, I work there, I know how dangerous it is. Uh, so, um, then he uh, became a pharmacist. So she was 13 when the family moved from this uh, little village outside Alonso into the town centre. And her parent, her father, who had fought in the Napoleonic Wars, as indeed Isidore, um, Louis' father had, um, then became a policeman. And then he became a mounted policeman, a very handsome man he was too. Um, but when he retired, they were a bit short of money and they decided to open a cafe with a billiard room on top. Um, billiards was very popular, but the cafe wasn't. Being because uh, Zili's mum was rather um, a rigid, her, her religious fervour was, shall we say, off-putting. She was always <laughs> preaching and telling them, telling people really how dreadful they were and how they didn't follow them. <laughs> well, that kind of put them off at the cafe. <laughs> so they became even shorter of money. So poor old Zili, when she wasn't at school, because they went to a local convent, which they both, she and her big sister, really enjoyed because they got away from home, I think. You know, they were set to work cleaning the floor and doing the cafe. She uh, found it a drudge, and she talked later on to her little brother, saying, as you know, my life as a child was as miserable as a shroud. That's pretty dramatic, a shroud that you bury people in. And she, uh, as a teenager, had a lot of migraine, which was probably secondary to all this stress that she was under from her, the mother. And you see, the problem was that the parents could not afford to give the two girls a dowry. If you don't have a dowry, you can't join a convent, and you can't get married as a bourgeois, a uh, French person. So um, what were they to do? So that was how she came to her marriage. How did she get married? Well, her mother had the common sense to get them enrolled in um, lace factories that were setting up. Um, Napoleon revivified, Napoleon III, the French lace industry, and Alonso was the most famous one, just before it died out. Because he said, I'm not buying any more lace from Paris, from Vienna, from sorry, not from Vienna, from Italy, which is the most expensive lace. And he 
uh, made all his babies um, on clothes out of the Alon using Alonso lace, so it became very popular. Uh, so she enrolled in that, and um, then uh, her sister, after doing it with her for five years, bumped off to become a nun. I say bumped off because I think Zimi felt very, very uh, abandoned. And suddenly she was in charge of the lace business, and uh, she loved her sister. She was so close to her sister, because her big sister looked after her, really. But um, she felt very sad about that. But having said that, she was a marvellous businesswoman, brilliant at doing the lace, and I'll tell you a little bit how we make that. It's a very interesting process and complicated. Um, and uh, actually, that's where she met her husband's mother, who lined her up to be um, wife for his, for her own re only remaining child. Um, Louis's mother had five children. Louis was the middle one, and they all died apart from him. Not as babies; they died as young adults for one reason or another. First one drowned. I think it's when he was seventeen. Um, died of illness or infection. So um, this. Uh, boy, the middle boy, was very precious to his mum. And he wanted to go off and become a monk. And he loved the mountains. And he, I shouldn't digress, but this is background to Zili's marriage. Um, he wanted to join the uh, monastery of St. Bernard's up in Switzerland. You know St. Bernard's Pass? Up in the mountains and the snow St. Bernard dogs? He wanted to go there. They said, you have to have some Latin. Well, the poor chap left school before he learnt Latin. So he enrolled in Latin classes. And for two years he tried to learn Latin. <clears throat> it gave him headaches and he could never learn it. So they wouldn't accept him. So his mum had him lined up to marry Zimi, but it's much more romantic than that because they met on the bridge. There's a very boring bridge in Alonsol. It's not an exciting bridge at all. It's just a plain flat bridge. And this tall, handsome man was walking one way. Zimi was walking the other way. And they looked at each other and Zili heard in her heart, this is the man you're going to marry. So they stopped and talked to each other, and they couldn't stop talking. And they were married four months later, pretty quick, but that's what they did in those days. It was normal to have a very short, uh, and they marry at, um, they, they go to the registry office at 10 o'clock, and then they get married at midnight. That's the tradition, so that's what they did. So uh, Louise Bunner was uh, greatly relieved, thought she'd get some grandchildren along, didn't she? And uh, we'll come on to that. But this is what she brought to her marriage. She brought the experience of her parents' marriage, as we all do, which was not a uh, smooth experience, but very exciting in the sense of her father's work, you know, moving around, being in the army until she, until they, until, until he retired. Um, she had a good education. She had secondary school education for, at the convent. But she was brought up with a very strictly religious mother who was very strong on Jansenism. I don't even know about Jansenism, but it's very um, judgmental. God is a very judgmental person, and you have to earn his, his favour, really. And uh, you have to earn your way to gain a place in heaven. But there's it's more complicated than that. But uh, the whole thing is that God is watching you, and God is adding up your sins, and you've got to pay for them, if you like. So she was brought up in that kind of Catholicism. And she was brought up with this sense of rejection by the Daughters of Charity. She wanted to become a nun. She would have been a brilliant. She wanted to care and help the people. But her mother, her mother's come into this quite a lot, which is very appropriate. Her mother spoke to the prioress before the interview. And uh, she was rejected. She could never find out why, but we have our suspicions. Yes. <laughs> um, so here she is. She comes to marriage an independent businesswoman, a lace artisan. She's lost her sister to the Visitation Monastery. But to show how successful she was, the Alonso lace was actually exhibited at the Crystal Palace in London at the first international exhibition, world exhibition, as an example of Alonso lace. And for all we know, one of her pieces was there. Um, she, I said that she had this inner voice on the bridge that this was the man to marry. She had another, she had three inner voices, three experiences of inner voice. 
or the Lucretian, or whatever you want to call it. The other one was to take up the lace work, actually. Um, she, she felt that God was calling her to uh, become um, independent, which is most unusual in those days for women. Uh, a bourgeois woman would have a diary and find a bourgeois man to marry or be put together by, by one of the mothers, no doubt. Um, and the third one was to have many children, to bring saints into the world. Now, I don't mean holy, holy saints, just that the French saint, the word saint, just means a good person. And all her children were good people. It wasn't that they would be canonised saints, though in fact we know that the youngest one, Thérèse of Lisieux, was canonised. So those were the three things she brought to marriage, to have children, to marry, and to do the lace work. So she married Louis on the 12th of July, 1858, and as I mentioned, the feast day is the date of their marriage, which is really lovely and really important, and the first, perhaps not the last, uh, feast day to be held on the day of a marriage as opposed to a death. And to put this in context, because it's very important to them, the 18th and final apparition to Bernadette by Our Lady of Lourdes occurred three days after their marriage. So they were married in this milieu of Our Lady appearing in France. And it was a time of revival of the Catholic Church against anti-clericalism, uh, um, very, very strong anti-clericalism. And, uh, and some of it quite well-founded, possibly. Uh, but the church was fighting back, and it was promoting pilgrimages, promoting uh, parish missions, which Zelia went to, she found them very boring, but she went religiously to those, and uh, all sorts of other activities that were supported and even funded by the Catholic Church, which they were very involved in themselves. I think between them, um, they, they were members of about 10 different confraternities or, or unions or, or different names that they were given, which were to do with um, caring for the poor in, in locally in the, in the town. The St. Vincent de Paul, for example, was one of them, which still carries on. Or they were uh, night adoration, promoting adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, all that. So they were involved in all these aspects of the revival of the Catholic Church. But anyway, move on to motherhood. Now, motherhood was delayed for 10 months. I said, you know, she had an experience of infertility. Well, not because she was infertile, nor indeed that her husband was, because they decided, he decided, they would have a white marriage. Um, purity was still very important. Perhaps this is another aspect of Jansenism. Purity, and the purest way to be pure was to have no sexual relationships. So he, as you know, wanted to be a monk. He had a place where he could go and pray, which was a tall tower, and uh, he could sit up there on the top and have all his books around him. And he wanted to be a working, uh, a married monk, really. He uh, had a career in watch, making watches and clocks. They both had a career in making beautiful small things. And uh, he was very good at that, too. So uh, for 10 months, there were no children, no conception. Every time she had a period, it was a loss of a potential child. She lived in this sense of loss, and yet she knew God wanted her to have children. What was she to do? Well, she went to see her sister in, in, the, in the convent, this, her big sister, and she said she'd never cried so much in her whole life, and this was the day of her wedding. So there was a lot of mixed stuff going on here, and yet she, and there they were, this going to be, she was working on one floor, and she was working on the other, he was working upstairs, and she was working downstairs, and it sounded, it looked as if, this was going to be their future. Well, luckily he had a confessor who told him that it was a load of rubbish and to make love to his wife, <laughs> which he proceeded to do. And within, um, let me, where have I wrote it down? 12 years, she had nine children. Nine children over 12 years. So she was pretty well pregnant most of the time, which exonerated her from all the fasting that the Catholic Church imposed far more immediate, while Lily religiously kept all the fasting. So she, if they had friends around, she used to get embarrassed because he was sitting there eating his lettuce leaf, and she cooked a lovely stew, so she always made sure that it wasn't a fast day if they had friends around. And she was quite sociable. 
Anyway, the um, first two children came along. Marie, born in 1860, and Pauline in 1861, and they were perfect. Easy pregnancy, easy birth. They made her feel the perfect mother. Um, and children do reflect, don't they, our parenting skills. If they are amenable, happy, successful, clever children, it's, it rubs off on us, doesn't it? Fun to. And it didn't hurt. Oh, I admit, I don't regret being married, she wrote. If you'd seen the two older ones today, Mary and Pauline, how pretty they looked. Everyone admiring them and could not take their eyes off them. And me, I was there beaming. I said to myself, they're mine. <laughs> Mary, the big girl, wanted a bigger house and smarter clothes when she went to school. She said, Mummy, she says, other people have got big houses. Why can't we move to a big house? Other people wear nice dresses. Why can't I buy another dress? Well, on the other hand, her mother was always taking them shopping. She wrote to her husband when he happened to be away with her very often. She said, I'm sure you think I do nothing but shop. But, you know, I have to do all this shopping for the children to look nice for their... They didn't have school uniforms, had to have nice dresses for school, etc. Preparing for Holy Communion, all the parties and social life they went to. So there was delight and tedium involved in that. And the third child came along, 1863 now, called Leonie. Again, uh, born at home like all the others, but more difficult delivery. And... Uh, very quickly developed eczema, described as purulent eczema, covered in eczema all over her body, for which there was no medical treatment, really. I'm not quite sure there still isn't. Um, so you know, you have to cover the poor child in lots of bandages to stop the scratching. And uh, very different to the other two. Delayed development, she just didn't walk, she didn't talk, until much later, she was oppositional, she didn't follow all the mothers wonderful and fathers' ways of managing their behaviour with rewards and little beads they can move along and count little chaplets that have been called. Therese was very good at that. But Lily, and later on, but Lily, I think she moved the beads so often in the wrong direction for all her faults that she sort of gave up, really. So it didn't work for her at all. And Mum was worried, sick about her. She, um, later on, when the, even when she was a teenager, age 13. Um, before that, sorry, she said that this poor child is covered in faults like a blanket. Mm. Isn't that descriptive? It makes you itch, doesn't it? Mm. It's her future that worries me the most. I say to myself, what will become of her if I'm no longer here? I don't dare think about it. How many times I've trembled at the thought of the unhappy future that awaits her. And then she said, God is very good to grant me compensation, which diminishes the bitterness of my poor, my poor Leonie causes me. I can't get through to her anymore. She only does what she wants, when she wants. And another time she says, this child will not reflect on me very well. So this was a very steep learning curve for mum. And uh, taught her a great deal, I think. We're moving on, I see the time is rushing by. We follow uh, Leonie's birth with Helene, and Helene was the first child that had to go to, um, to be breastfed elsewhere. Mum at this stage couldn't breastfeed, we don't know why, but she did develop cancer of the breast from which she died. So um, Helene went to a, a, a wet nurse in, in the town, and uh, she thrived. Uh, Two years after her birth, the first little boy was born, Joseph, Joseph Louis, and he went to a wet nurse, which was um, the first time that they used a lovely lady called Rose, Rose Tai, in a little village. And uh, New Year's Eve was the most important feast, it's always more important than Christmas, and she couldn't bear to be without her baby, so she walked along these icy roads to pick up the little baby first thing in the morning, carried him all wrapped up back home, and had all the family around and all the party and she, she paraded him around in the clothes she'd got for him and her father, her husband teased her saying you're parading him around as if he was a doll. She just loved it and he was a nice strong little boy. Anyway the day came and you know he needed feeding so she trudged all the way back. He was only five months old and uh, the next morning there was frantic communication from Rose 
he was very ill and he died um, eight, eight months of enteritis gut infection and uh, erysipelas, skin infection. So he obviously, and she blamed herself, of course. I killed my son. So we, she's been through, some of you might have had experiences or know of people whose children died for one reason or another. So she had a second baby called Joseph again. Um, he was very feeble and ill and uh, he died uh, age eight months, again with enteritis, but he had bronchitis as well. And he was also looked after by Rose. Can't blame Rose, she was a wonderful wet nurse. She's pregnant now again, and she's saying, and I think this will brings for people I know who maybe have had a lot of miscarriages and then become, conceive a child, and are afraid of losing it. You can't imagine how frightened I am, she said, of the future, about this little person, Celine, I'm expecting. It seems to me that the fate of the last two children, the two Josephs, will be his fate. She thought it was another boy. And it's a never-ending nightmare for me. I believe the dread is worse than the misfortune. The fear for me is torture. And then she said, the best thing is to put everything in the hands of God. So putting everything in the hands of God didn't release her from her fear, her nightmares, her terror, her exhaustion. Didn't release her, didn't put her into a sort of seventh heaven. She experienced all that as being in the hands of God. The two were not separate. The one was the same as the other. And this, I think, is so important. So she then uh, conceived the, the baby that was born was Celine who was the uh, fourth surviving child just be before uh, Therese de Jure. And she nearly died. She went to a wet nurse in the village, in the town, and Louis was slightly worried about this, so he would wander outside, listening out for her, and he heard this pitiful wailing. And he rushed into the house to this top floor where this woman was living, to find his daughters lying in a cot, neglected and half starved. And he rushed, he couldn't get hold of the the wet nurse, so he knocked on the door of the neighbour and they said, oh, well, she's at the pub, she's always at the pub. She was an alcoholic. And so they whipped Celine home and she nearly died, but she didn't. Then the Melanie Therese was born, she was sent to a different local wet nurse, and couldn't use the same one again. And it was Marie, the oldest daughter, who spotted on a visit that she was starving. And she died aged seven weeks. Neglect, starvation. So this is, I could tell you a whole story about the wet nurse situation in France. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, very much affected at their time by the Industrial Revolution and all the young women going to work in factories and having to use wet nurses for their babies, which they couldn't take with them. And then blow me down if Helene didn't die aged five, her daughter's daughter was broken her dad's heart. We don't know why she died, she might have had leukemia. But mum gave us some soup water that trying to revive to give her child a bit of energy and she died after eating the soup and with the bread I think she put in it and then she writes this sorrowful letter to her brother do you think I killed her by giving her the soup I think I was responsible um, so she, I think I'm getting to that she went through things she went through then Therese came along Fine, bouncy baby. She was determined to keep her at home, but after four days, she was rushed off to the breast to the to Rose Tiley, or to Rose Tiley came to fetch her because uh, she was limp and developing enteritis. And Rose rushed in, put her to the breast. They all watched. Nothing happened. And then suddenly, Therese lifted up her head and started sucking. And she went back, and uh, she grew up for the first year of her life thinking Rose was her mummy. And the four little children that Rose had were her brothers and sisters. So. But um, that was the, the last child to be born, and the fifth child has survived. But with all this, she was working away with her lace. And she was running her business, bringing in the workers. She had nine for every bit of lace that they made. And there's some patterns, and the, there's a photograph album at the back. And at the end of that, there's some lovely pictures of the lace that she made. Um, made by nine different workers and they used to bring her their particular pattern uh, every Thursday and then she'd piece it all together 
to fulfill the orders. Sometimes the orders were thick and fast and she uh, wanted to play with the children, so she'd play with the children and then work until all hours and then get up for 5.30 mass. I think you've all been through all this. This is all normal motherhood, isn't it? Um, she, why did she work so hard? She got the dowry for her five girls, 20,000 francs she saved for each child. She wasn't going to let them go through what she went through. There was a lot of failure in her background, failure of her parents' cafe, failure to become a nun, quote unquote, desperate for her children not to suffer, responsibility for her workers. If there wasn't enough work, she wanted to keep them because they needed the money, there was no social, social, social support in those days, but also she lost good workers. They would go off to some, some other business and she'd lose some people she trained up herself. And actually she loved it. She loved doing the lace, sitting by her window in the daylight. It was on the business side that was a nuisance. Anyway, I mentioned um, another aspect of Zili, briefly in my introduction, about um, the war, the Franco-Prussian War. And she experienced that firsthand because her children were at Le Mans, in a, um, a town at Borders School, the older two. She went to visit them and she saw all the, the ravages of the war. And it affected her because there was a Carmelite convent there. All the convents were given the <coughs> injured soldiers from France to, to look after because the hospitals were overflowing, including the Carmelite convent. And they said, oh no, we can't take men into our house. And there were 30 patients landed on their doorstep. And the, the authorities just said, well, if you can't take them, we'll leave them there. So they did. Tell you a lot more about that. Her final vocation in her life was cancer mentioned. She had a little inkling in her breast, pain in her breast, and she told her brother, who was a medical student, he said, don't worry mum, put some cream on it. So she did. Didn't make any difference, just she knew it wouldn't. She called it her little boo-boo as it started to swell up. And by the time she actually sought help, uh, so it was inoperable. Oh, surgery in those days, you know, 50% chance of survival anyway, because it was pre-antibiotic era. So she died in 1876, December the 17th. Oh, that's um, she died just before her 45th birthday. And she did go to Lourdes under the uh, pressure from her family. Mm -hmm. And actually she fell there and cricked her neck and by that time all her bones were full of cancer. Oh. She died in agony from that. And had a horrendous journey there. The children were supposed to help her, and all they did was wind and worry, and their shoes were too tight, and somebody spilled coffee all over the clothes in the suitcase. And, you know, it was just a disastrous visit, basically. Um, and she wrote all about it, it's all there. It's wonderful stories. Um, so let me finish with thinking about what held her together, what holds us together. And really, it's relationships. She, uh, her husband to her was a great support. And she said she never felt happy unless she was with him. And he was a quiet man, and, but we'll see after her death that he blossomed, if you like. He had to take charge. He was a single parent of five little girls. And it wasn't daunting possible. She fed herself spiritually. I said she mentioned she went to Mass every morning. She wasn't always allowed to take communion because she had to go to confession within I don't know, 12 hours of going to communion forgotten, but that was how I was brought up too originally. She was a lay Franciscan, I think I've mentioned. There was a Paul Clare convent and she used to meet there once a month, but she also talked to the nuns. They were like an extended family. She asked them to pray for her brother when he was doing his medical exams, that sort of thing. And they were very important to her. I've mentioned the role of Our Lady. Uh, she was almost a member of the family. It's the statue of Our Lady, which uh, was brought to heal Therese. You know the story of Therese. She, had a terrible illness where she was seeing uh, horrible devils and things, and everybody despaired for her. But um, Our Lady came and they took the statue in desperation, and Our Lady smiled at her. That was the statue Louis kept in his little room upstairs. So Zuli, Zili brought us a concertina of deeply felt experiences. They were real. And these gradually transformed her through her marriage. And it's the same for us. And the people that transform us are not the successes. They are the difficult children. The being torn apart by 
the demands of work and wanting to be with your children or having a sick child and saying, you know, who's going to care for her? Holidays coming up, what am I going to do? Um, we, like Zili, want to be perfect mothers. Of course we do. <coughs> but through our experiences, we gain the humility to be imperfect, to be just adequate, at least, to be good enough and to be loved in all our failures. We're not loved because we're successful parents. We're loved because we stick in there. And I see it going on all the time. I see it on the tube with a dad holding his baby. I see it with my own in-laws, my own children, grandchildren. You see it all around you. Just walk down the street and see parents with their children. They're living this sacramental life, though they most likely are in oblivious to it. She suffered all these things, I think, on our behalf, with her absolute faith in God's goodness and love. And finally, our mission is, uh, as Catholic mothers, the domestic church. The mission is very simple. It's to become more and more what the family is. That is to say, a community of life and love. Hence, the church tells us, the family has the mission to guard, reveal, and communicate love. Rooted in love. And this is a living reflection of, and a real sharing of God's love. The two are intertwined. And they're one and the same. Where there is love, there is God, St. John the Evangelist tells us. And the love of Christ the Lord for the church, his bride. What a wonderful symbolism. We could talk about that for the next while. This is the domestic church. This is the priesthood of the laity. We all are priests by virtue of our baptism. And we don't expect the journey to be sweet because it's holy, but with Zini, we know that God cares for us. And he does not give us more than we can bear, as she often said. Failure turns out to be his plan. Weakness opens our heart to his help. So is she an inspiration? Perhaps she is. Let's finish with a little prayer to her. Perhaps we can all say this together. It's on the back of your leaf. <coughs> prayer for our family. God of our Almighty Father, we ask you to bless our family, following the example of the Martin family. May we never give up when life is difficult. May we have your strength and healing when health is poor. May the Eucharist be the sight of our lives. May prayer be our daily strength. May the Trinity be the source of our love. May our family remain united throughout the years, especially when we are far from each other. We ask this with faith and confidence. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Stay safe and do us. Pray for us. I wondered if, um, through all of um, Zelie's grief and everything that she went through with losing her children, did she ever have any kind of crises of faith where she um, struggled with her struggled with her belief in God? Yes, or I think she did. I think there were some very very black periods for her mm. where she felt that life wasn't worth living, and she uh, actually uh, talks about that in her letters. Mm. Um, and then she kind of has faith in faith, if you like. But it's not because she's feeling particularly loved or held. She, uh, I think she wrote at one stage, um, life at the moment is very, very dark for me. Mm. And uh, particularly after her father died, I haven't mentioned that she got her father to come and live with them when um, he was getting a bit too frail to live on his own because his wife had died some time before. And uh, he was this great gruff ex-soldier but he fascinated all his grandchildren with all the stories of his wars and things. And 
wonderful member of the family and when he died she went through complete stages of grief. She walked around the graveyard saying, I think he's going to reappear any minute. I can't believe he's dead. My heart is absolutely broken. My life is just, I just want to die, she said, to be with him. And she said that about her babies too. I just mm -hmm. want to die too. Especially Helen, she wanted to die. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were there any grandchildren? Well, not really, because I'm afraid they all joined up with us nuns. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the four, four of them went to the Carmel in Lisieux, and uh, uh, the Leonie, who the, the, the dreadful one, is, um, as Elise called her, they sent Leonie off to boarding school three times. They thought that would kind of cure her, um, because uh, Zelie's sister, Elise, was the uh, prior was teacher there, was very good with difficult children. And she wrote to her sister once, saying to, to Zeely, I've got this terrible child with me. No, she won't listen to anyone else. I mean, this terrible child, they think, will be the next canonized saint in this family. And uh, she joined a different, she went to Khan, joined a different monastery. She wonders now, what we know, whether the child was autistic. Mm. You know, um, the child was autistic? We wonder now, with what we know, whether the child was in fact autistic, not naughty, but just... Oh no, what happened was she was being bullied. Mm -hmm. um, she had developmental, she'd been being bullied by um, Louise, who was the, the maid at the time, um, who was um, forcing her to do things under fear of punishment. And the main thing she forced her to do was to disobey everything her mother told her. Because she thought this would, I don't know what she thought really, but um, when um, her mother found out, she was, you can imagine, just distraught. And there were just a few months, really, before the mum died, of, of that relationship between them improving. She wasn't autistic, but she, she was a terribly lonely, isolated child, a very unhappy child. She was the middle one, her little sister, Helen, had died. Uh, the other two younger ones were buddies together, the two older ones were buddies together, went off to boarding school. And she was sort of left in the middle. And even her sister wrote about her, as calling her the cuckoo in the nest. She was so concerned that she said, Mummy, did you give birth to me or was it, um, was, did I get switched over for somebody else? She actually asked that because mm. she looked different, she had a big chin, a big nose, um, she wasn't pretty. And she, you say she's on her way to... We do because she, she followed in a great community the way of, the little way of her little sister Therese oh, okay. to such perfection. Amazing. Yeah. She, uh, but she was the one who was, uh, went through a very, very difficult time. She tried to join the convents, one convent or another, she tried several, <laughs> about three or four times, and she could never cope with it, and she had to come home. So her life was just a whole series of failures, really, mm. if you look at it like that. But no, no children, no grandchildren. Did Zelly see any of the children join convents? Did she, was she alive when no, she didn't know. She never saw any. She knew Pauline them. wanted to. Okay. She supported Pauline. Pauline joined after she died. She was the first to go. Mm. Yeah. So she didn't know. And Marie, she just thought Marie would never join up. Marie was far too interested in nice clothes and dancing. They were very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Leonie would, was, would, she couldn't understand why Leonie would be slightly bit interested if she was covered in faults like a blanket then and she couldn't become a nun. So she wasn't sort of planning for them all to, to join up. But there would be saints in, in the French sense of being good, holy people. Mm. Mm. Yes? If you need to get a hold of a, of a book, of, uh, a copy of the Emilio uh, Letters. Oh, easily, yes. Mm -hmm. They sell them at the um, Carmelite Priory, the book, book service there. You can get onto their website. Um, and probably have it on Amazon as well. Yeah, the book's there if you want to get right now. It's worth getting, it really is. You said that she wrote to her brother a lot. Who else did she write to? Her, her daughter, Pauline, and her sister-in-law, Celine, uh, another Celine. They all use the same names, I don't know why they're so <laughs> um, Her brother-in-law, her sister-in-law, her brother's wife, they became very close, great, great friends. And it was her who had the stillbirth. And uh, you should, the letter that Zeely wrote was so, so lovely. She suffered it as much as you could, really. Um, and then when Pauline was at boarding school, 
but she filtered those letters slightly so as to not tell us some of the dreadful things that went on. Mm. Like the war, for example. Yeah. And why do you think that these letters were preserved? I mean, she was an ordinary woman and she wrote letters. Mm. Usually they are not kept in an archive, no? Letters that are written by ordinary. Who no, preserved the letters or why? Was well, it? her daughter, they, they kept them because they, they, they thought they were such, such wonderful letters. Were they uh, preserved in the Carmel? In, in the Carmel? Hmm? In, in the Carmel, the, the daughters were Carmelite nuns preserved the letters of the mother. No, no, she didn't write to them as Carmelite nuns. But. Oh, well, where were the letters kept? Yes, yes. I see what you mean, yes. Um, they, when the case was put forward for canonization, Everybody had to contribute everything that they had, including all the letters. So uh, that was all pulled together at that time. So was it normal that people kept correspondence? I think they did, much more than we do, yeah. especially her letters, which were so fascinating. Actually, but a lot were lost as well. Sorry, I'm French, and I don't know if it's cultural or not, but my husband's great-great-grandfather did the First World War, and all the letters we have, Mm -hmm. All the letters mm -hmm. that went between his wife and yes. when he was at war, mm -hmm. and yeah. that is kept in the family, oh, and they've now all been digitalized, and mm -hmm. it will go, it will keep going. Mm -hmm. in the family. Yes, and I've got to say, somebody's printed on my mind of that generation all the letters. Yeah. Right. I think it's time for a cup of coffee, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, um, uh, we have another talk lined up, if you want to put it in your diaries, um, on the 25th of June. Chiara Finaldi, who runs Catholic Mothers, the larger organisation, she has got Stephanie Block coming over from America, and she is the goddaughter of Alice von Hildebrand. Oh. Um, the uh, wife of Dietrich von Hildebrand, who was a big um, philosopher, I think he was, wasn't he? Um, so she is coming over to do talks about Alice von Hildebrand and her um, and her outlook on femininity. And she's going to be coming here. She's doing talks in London, and then she's coming to St Gregory's to do a talk on the 25th of June about marriage. So if you'd like to put that in your diary, that's our next. That will be our next meeting. Yes, but thank you very much, Annette. That was really, really wonderful. Thank you. Lovely to be there. You're wonderful lot. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, Lord, for organising it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.